We are uh, starting a new series today that potentially is 37 weeks long. <laughs> the excitement here. Um, but I've decided in my wisdom, uh, which I have a, a little bit of, is, is to reduce it ever so slightly to 35. I'm, I'm joking. D down to, well, it's nine. To d down to nine um, sessions. Um, you'll be pleased to know that in between um, uh, this little series, there will be other preachers, so it's not going to be kind of like a, a nine-week-long session just with me. Uh, you're supposed to say boo at that point. <laughs> oh, we, <laughs> we need to rehearse before the service, I think, don't we? Um, no, so what we're going to be doing, um, actually, who was listening to me last time? So if you weren't here, you get away with this. Um, uh, last time, uh, I told you what I was going to be preaching on, the next series. I did, I did. <laughs> this is really, really, it wasn't, oh, you were so close. Go a couple, pardon? Not Romans, no, you're going the wrong, going the wrong way. Parables. I'll put you out of your misery. It's parables. Oh, yeah, of course, of course. I did. I did say it. You need to look back on my recordings and, and see. No, it's parables. It's parables we're going to be looking at. So I want to just give an introduction uh, to start with um, to looking at parables. And I'm going to pick, there are 37 parables. Uh, that's why it was 37. But I'm only going to pick eight that I'm going to look at over, uh, over time. Um, and if you want to follow uh, the whole series in one go, then we have a YouTube channel, and you can listen to them all back to back. <laughs> no? Okay, no. That's fine. So, I'm going to start with a parable. There was this rough uh, piece of ground in the middle of a clearing in the wood, just outside a village. A group from the village decided to make a cricket pitch on it and learn how to play. The first season, their opponents laughed. It's too rough, it's too bumpy. You're terrible as well at playing. You can't bowl, you can't bat. It's too easy. Season after season, the group continued to improve the pitch and their playing. They dedicated themselves, working hard, long hours, and as much time as they could, and they invested what spare money they had into it. Now, eight seasons in, the village was no longer laughed at or scorned, but a place where all the other teams wanted to play. But that village, those players, never forgot their humble start. They continued to invest in the pitch and practice as many hours as they could afford. A little parable to you. I made it up. It's not from the Bible. Don't panic. You're kind of flicking through and saying, where did Jesus say that? He didn't. He didn't. But a little parable. So what is a parable? It's a short, simple story that teaches a lesson. That's what we're looking at uh, in these parables. And within that parable uh, that I told, um, the, 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 the message, I guess, there is that dedication and hard work pays off uh, in that. So there we go. I made that up. Oh, dear. <laughs> I give. I don't know why I bother. Uh, anyway, so um, one of my favourite uh, books, uh, uh, if I say of all time, apart from my most favourite, well, book, my most famous uh, 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 favourite, sorry, series actually um, is uh, the Chronicles of Narnia. You can't beat it. Okay, uh, I think that's just just phenomenal. I, I, I'll be honest. I think uh, the Lord of the Rings series was just too thick. Uh, when I looked at it to read, I've already, oh, here we go, we're kind of, oh, it's, it's lunchtime, you better go. No, I get it, I get it, that's fine, that's fine. <laughs> I mean, it's got to come a good second, surely. 
Yeah, all right, no. Oh, first. Okay, that's fine. We'll, we'll agree to differ on that. No, but one of my favorite books is actually by um, uh, Nick Butterworth. Uh, he's the author, and Mick Ink Penn, the illustrator, and it's Stories Jesus Told. And it's a wonderful, uh, just the, the simplicity of what they have done with Jesus' parables, and if I say even more simplified them, um, to get a beautiful point across uh, for younger, younger people, for, for children. Stories that Jesus told. Now, often we think of parables as just that, don't we? That it's stories that Jesus told. But not all parables are from Jesus, okay? Now, I've probably picked, I hope, uh, the most famous of all parables that isn't from Jesus. And it's Nathan the prophet who tells a short, simple story to King David, And we find this in 2 Samuel, chapter 12 and verses 1 to 7. It says this. I just want to draw a little point from it as well, um, which is why I'm reading it. Uh, So the Lord sent Nathan to David. Uh, When he came to him, he said, There are two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man has a large number of sheep and cattle, But the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb he had bought. He raised it and it grew up with him and his children. It shared his food, drank from his cup and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveller came to the rich man. But the the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveller who had come to him. Instead... He took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for one who had come to him. David burned with anger against the man. And he said to Nathan, as surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. He must pay for the lamb four times over because he did a thing and had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, you are that man. How powerful is that parable? That uh, God gave to Nathan, just to give a little bit of background, just to refresh our memory slightly of what's going on. David was supposed it was a season where kings went to war, and David didn't go to war with his troops. He stayed at home in in the comfort. And one evening he couldn't sleep and he's upstairs on the roof and he looks out. He sees Bathsheba and craves her and presumably sent messengers and she came and things happened and she became pregnant. And in this, David then thought, What am I going to do? I know what. Let's just bring Uriah back and let's try and fool Uriah, get him, come to seat with his wife, and then everything will be fine. But Uriah, being a good soldier, slept at the the palace gate. And so, what did he do? He sent uh, a letter to the front line, uh, uh, Joab, the, um, uh, the general, to say, put Uriah in the thick of the battle, get him killed. And who delivers that letter? It's Uriah that has to deliver his own death sentence. God is not pleased. Uriah dies. God is not pleased. And so Nathan the prophet comes to deliver this parable to David because it stirred David's emotion. I think if Nathan just went in there and said, what are you doing? David would have brushed it off. He was in in that point where, actually, what was going on, he he was just out to look after himself. God, through Nathan, presents it in a very different way. And it's so, so powerful. And I I just, I do, in a weird kind of way, just love uh, verse 5 where it says David burned with anger against the man because it's almost like the kind of like I don't know if anybody fishes or seen that kind of 
the hook is in and it's kind of it's, it's reeling him in and the anticipation and I kind of whenever I read it I kind of I want to kind of skip to that bit where it where it says you are that man the anticipation of the delivery of that line it makes a very strong point and David immediately understands immediately knows what he's done has been wrong and he seeks God's forgiveness or he falls upon God's mercy for forgiveness so how a parable can be just so powerful when we look at uh, at parables we can see uh, that the story is a known story for those who are listening David understood all about rich and poor because I guess he'd been in, in kind of in both positions uh, to an extent on the poor side, but obviously knew about sheep, knew about visitors coming, knew about the idea that actually, yes, let's sacrifice the best for a visitor who's coming. And when Jesus told parables, a lot of the parables were about sheep sowing seeds, wineskin nets, masters and servants and those kind of things the stories that Jesus told people of the day would have understood what was going on so my little my little parable um, just because we're opposite a cricket pitch uh, or a cricket pitch is opposite us which oh which way around is it oh I don't know which way I think I think the church might have been here first so they're opposite us. Let's say that. Let's say that. They're opposite us. So today's stories may, uh, and parables maybe should be more about cars, online shopping. I, I, I was trying to think of a great online shopping parable, but I thought, no, let's just keep it simple and, and, and go for the cricket instead. Uh, maybe DIY, parables about sports, hobbies, parables about washing machines maybe even, um, and maybe cricket as well. So what's the point of a parable? The point is that it's simple, and actually it's very direct. But we've got to make sure in looking at parables that we don't miss the hidden meaning behind it all. But also to make sure that we're not looking too deep into the parable, that we actually miss the simplicity of it and a simple meaning behind it. So I think with a parable, we're actually looking at two different things, something quite deep and something quite simple. I just put a question at this point here, and I guess it's down to the individual preacher, really. But should we use more parables today in our preaching. It's something that Jesus did a lot of. So maybe, uh, as I say, it's just a question I pose maybe myself. Um, Tim's the only other one here that, uh, that preaches uh, regularly. Um, so I guess it's to you as well, Tim. <laughs> should we or should we not be using parables more? Uh, because Jesus did. But I think it's, it's about our particular style maybe. Uh, on that anyway so that's just a question to pose but in looking at Jesus uh, through the parables that Jesus told I, I find this really confusing because I'm going to be looking at um, some parables over the next couple of weeks couple of months and I'm going to explain to you what I think it all means but when Jesus uh told his parables, told his stories, he didn't explain the parables to the masses. It was just to the few. So what can we draw from that, uh, maybe? I want to just read to you, um, just to kind of just show what, what kind of um, I'm talking about within that, why he didn't explain things. So it's Matthew chapter 13, uh, it's verses 10 to 17, and then we'll skip a little bit to 34 and 35 of chapter 13. Uh, it says this, uh, The disciples came to him and asked, Why do you speak to the people in parables? He replied, Because the knowledge of the secrets 
of the kingdom of heaven have not been given to you. Sorry, start that bit again. Because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you. Oh, that was close, wasn't there? We can twist scripture very easily. But not to them. The secrets of the kingdom of heaven have not been given to them. Whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. This is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For the people's hearts have become callous. They harden they hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their heart, and turn, and I will heal them. I just find that verse just absolutely incredible. That it's, it's us. Uh, I spoke um, last, it wasn't last week, the week before, uh, about um, a callous heart and the problem is our heart and actually we can so easily um, have callous I don't know I'm, I'm not uh, I used to milk cows um, but now my hands have gone soft it's been too long since I've done any kind of manual labor if you see uh, somebody who has and see those calluses I used to get um, I don't know what that what's the bit at the bottom of your finger called the top of your palm Top of your palm, I guess. Simple as that. But you, you get those little bits there. And you, they used to, uh, when I used to do proper work, they used to blister. I don't know if you ever had those blisters. Now I, 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 I use a broom for about five minutes and I get a blister down my, down my palm. That's how soft my hands have become. But, which is, I guess is what my heart should be, is be soft. But we've got to be careful, haven't we, that our hearts don't become callous at all just want to put that in there anyway so uh, verse 16 chapter 13 of uh, Matthew um, but blessed oh he comes round. it's okay but blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear for truly I tell you many prophets and righteous people righteous people longed to see what you see but did not see it and to hear what you hear but did not hear it and then it just goes on uh, Jesus spoke, 34, Jesus spoke all these things to the crowd in parables. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. So, uh, so was fulfilled uh, what was spoken through the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden since the creation of the world. So Jesus taught a lot and mainly in parables. It was part of that was to fulfill prophecy. And as we know, that uh, all that was prof prophesied about him in the Old Testament, every single one of those prophecies became true. Just almost, just almost beyond extra evidence that we needed to understand who Jesus is, that Jesus is God. But within that, I will just say that Jesus... Jesus' teaching wasn't just in parables. We've got the Sermon on the Mount. Now, actually, the Sermon on the Mount does finish with a parable. Now, 10 points, if you can tell me what parable the uh, Sermon on the Mount finishes with. Or oh, a bit louder. It's not the feast, no. It, oh, dear, oh. Back to Sunday school. <laughs> it's, there's two people and they're doing the same thing, but differently. Not sewing. Shall I put you out of your misery? But yes! Top of the class. Well done. Ten points as well. I don't know what you can do with those ten points, but you've now got ten points more than anybody else in this room. It's, it is, it's the wise and foolish builder. Oh, if you hear my words and, and don't put them in to action, you're like the foolish builder. If you do hear, you are like the, no, 
anyway, that's fine. Stella's got the pride to know, although not kind of in an ungodly pride kind of way, obviously, that she now has 10 points. So, yes, yeah, so a wise and foolish builder. Okay, so the Sermon on Mount, although it is quite direct, so for example, Matthew chapter 5, uh, 30, uh, 43 to 47, you have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. Um, he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Not even the tax collectors, are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Don't even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. I think that's quite direct. I don't think there's a parable in there at all. Jesus' teaching is very, very, very straight. So within his preaching, he is teaching in parables, but he also uses very direct teaching as well. But I think what I found interesting when I was just kind of looking into all of this, and I think to reflect for ourselves on this as well, is, um, so I think sometimes, so what I'm basically saying, I don't think it's just about me who's preaching here to be, I need to talk in parables. Um, I think it's for us in everyday life. If we are all disciples of Jesus, and we've all been given that task to, to go into the world to, to make disciples, I think it's for us that maybe we need to think about talking to people in parables, for them to kind of begin to understand and see God's truths in that. Almost a kind of, not a test, but almost actually do they desire and do they crave teaching from Jesus? Sometimes I think we do need to be very direct, as Jesus is in the Sermon on the Mount. Love your enemy, hate, oh, sorry, no, I've got, yes, I did say that, didn't it? Um, I, I read it all because otherwise I'll get myself confused. Love your, you have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I tell you, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. So sometimes we need to be quite direct, as Jesus was. And then other times... And I love this little bit, it's in everyday life that Jesus takes the opportunity. Now, Jesus is Jesus and we're not, so it's understanding that difference. But Jesus teaches in the everyday. So, uh, Matthew chapter 9, verses uh, 10 to 13, it says this. Uh, While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. So it's just Jesus in everyday life. I don't think Jesus had prepared a sermon at all. Now, to get into the theology of um, Jesus knowing what was going to happen, I'm not going to touch that, okay, about the preparation that he would have done. But in the everyday, he is presented in this situation. Um, that he's at Matthew's house and many tax collectors and sinners are there. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, here's the opportunity that Jesus now has to, to teach. On hearing this, Jesus says, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but those who are ill. But go and learn what it means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. So Jesus' is, Jesus is teaching, as I'm kind of just picking it up a little bit, are kind of done in three ways. There are the parables, there is the directness, and then there's the bit in everyday life where something presents itself and actually we can speak into uh, in, in, into situations, to people's lives. So, parables are important. And I think, as we find with, especially with the disciples, that quite often they, they, they go to him and they say, can you explain to us what that means? And I think then with us, there is that, that need, that desire to, to understand these parables 
more, to understand the simple meaning, but also the hidden meaning as well. And that can only come through Jesus, as he did with his disciples when he taught just the 12 and sometimes just the three as well, which I think is, it, that's another sermon in itself that is fascinating. Um, so, I'm coming to a close of this little introduction uh, to it all, um, but just to kind of maybe whet your appetite on it, on it all, um, the parables that I've chosen, uh, just to have a look at, what I've done purposely is I've tried not to p pick those ones that are, in inverted commas, famous or the well-known ones, okay? Um, as I said, there are 37 uh, parables um, to choose from. Um, so uh, if I could do maths, that would be amazing. So the other 29 parables that I'm not going to pick, I'm going to give you, all you as homework to go away and do your own research. <laughs> Dave wishes he wasn't here now. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm not. Um, the good news is I've already done one right when I first started here at the church. Um, you'll all remember so well and so fondly, for those that were, were here at the time, um, I did new wines into old wineskins. Oh, don't do this to me. Surely you remember that. I'm not going to go over it. I've won. Really? You put your hand up. You want, you want five points? Five points for putting your hand up. Well done. Excellent. Um, so, so talking about new wine and it bursts. If you put new wine into old wine skins, it bursts. There was a little bit more to it than that. Um, but if you go back right at the beginning of, of our YouTube, you might find it. Um, after about five hours of scrolling. Um, but, so the ones I'm going to do, so I'm not going to do that one because I've done it already. Okay, it's, um, some of these you go, oh, what on earth is that about? That's fine, don't worry, we're going to discover together. So there's the friend at night. Remember that one? Excellent nods. Uh, the rich fool. The leaven. Drawing in the net. Uh, that me, I had to look that one up. I could not think what that one was. Drawing in the net is one. It's Matthew 13, as it happens, um, uh, 47 to 50. It's just literally three verses or four verses, including 47 to 50. So in going back to what a, a parable is, this being a short, simple story that makes just an amazing point, literally two sentences, and if you think about um, uh, the, um, the hidden treasure... That's literally one sentence in the Bible. And yet, the power of all those words, I think, is just phenomenal. So, as I say, parables are just so, so amazing. So, uh, drawing in a net, the master and servant, uh, Pharisees and the publican, the great banquet and the talents or minas, if that's how it's pronounced, minas, maybe it's minas, minas, minas. That's what I'm going to pronounce it. How are we pronouncing it? Miners. You're going to do miners, is it? Keep it forest. The miners. Excellent. So, um, I hope I've whetted your appetite a little bit um, into, um, into looking at parables. Not necessarily looking forward to my preaching, uh, but looking at parables and finding uh, both the hidden meaning and also the simple meaning uh, behind it all as well. As all good sermons end with, Amen. Amen. <laughs>